This video is all about carbon cycling. It's a standard level topic from C4.2 on transfers of energy and matter. The best way to teach you about carbon cycles is to draw one, but don't fall into the trap of wasting exam time drawing intricate pictures of organisms or cute trees. That's not how we do it. When we say draw a carbon cycle diagram, maybe construct is a better term, we're not drawing any pictures. We're going to use words. We're going to put boxes around things that represent pools of carbon, and that's where um, carbon gets stored. And we're going to use arrows to represent changes or fluxes, the transfer of carbon from one pool to another. So here's an example of a way to get this started. There exists a pool of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That then is transferred to producers during the process of photosynthesis. So here are my pools, here is my flux. Notice I'm showing an arrow to show which direction it goes. So I've gone ahead and I've added some of these other carbon pools or carbon reserves here, and we'll talk about how they're related. Now, carbon is transferred from producers to consumers through the process of eating. So that's my carbon fluxes eating. Those consumers are then going to add carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere when they do cell respiration. So when they take that food and they combust that as fuel, right? When they oxidize it. Now, consumers and producers both die, womp womp, okay? Um, they both become dead matter. So death results in these producers and consumers um, turning into dead matter. This dead matter, two things can happen to it depending on the conditions. One is that decomposers can use it um, and they can, this dead matter can decay, they can do decomposition. That's just a fancy form of cell respiration. So decomposers can do cell respiration, and that again will add carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. If decomposers aren't available, if there's no oxygen, for some reason this dead matter does not get all the way decomposed, it can become a fossil fuel like coal, oil, or natural gas through the process of fossilization. Now, that, that carbon will remain trapped in those fossil fuels for a long time, forever actually, until they are burned. And when they are burned, that is going to release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And we don't say burned, we use the proper term, that's something called combustion. The combustion of fossil fuels is a huge flux, okay? A huge carbon flux. So I want you to take a note, this is what a carbon cycle diagram should look like, not cute pictures of trees and giraffes, but clearly labeled pools that we surround with boxes and clearly labeled flux that we use labeled arrows for. Now, ecosystems are open, right? So they can gain and lose matter and energy. And when we say gain or lose matter, what we're talking about is that flux, right? So in terms of the carbon cycle, the main fluxes are photosynthesis and respiration. Those are the two big ones. And they have to do, or the balance between those can determine whether or not something is a carbon source or a carbon sink. A carbon sink is going to be a place that has a net uptake of carbon. So this is a spot where carbon has been removed from the atmosphere and it's storing it. These are going to be places where there is a lot more photosynthesis compared to respiration. So forests are great carbon sinks because those organisms, those plants, those Photo autotrophs are taking all of that carbon in and converting them into carbon compounds and storing them. A carbon source is going to be a net release of carbon. So this is going to be something that is adding to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in terms of photosynthesis and respiration, that means that there will be more respiration than photosynthesis. Now, this is a bit of an oversimplification because what we're not mentioning are some of the other major fluxes in our carbon cycle, right? So this could be highly influenced by decomposition rates. The more decomposition we have, the more carbon is released. Biosequestration, I love this word. It's exactly how it sounds. 
living things sequestering or storing carbon. So for example, a lot of marine organisms will store carbon in the fact that they use carbon to make calcium carbonate shells. So they're holding on to that carbon or fires, or it could even be the burning of fossil fuels, that combustion. This is a fossil fuel called peat. So Yes, that these sources and sinks generally have greater um, or less photosynthesis compared to respiration, um, but there are other things that can influence the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as well. So to go back to our picture here, these fossil fuels are going to be a major carbon sink. They're storing a ton of carbon in there from those partially decomposed dead organisms when you burn them, okay, when you put them through this process of combustion, that is going to release a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In order for this carbon cycle to work to be sustainable, the amount of carbon that is being removed from the atmosphere has to equal the amount of carbon being released back up into the atmosphere. Okay, so if I think about this and I'm thinking about things that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so those are the uptake processes, I'm only showing one right here, which is photosynthesis. That means we have to have so much photosynthesis to equal out the amount that is being added by cell respiration in either consumers or producers, I forgot to draw that arrow, or decomposition and combustion of fossil fuels. And so right now, what we're currently finding is these increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the release is currently outpacing the uptake, that we have far less uptake than we do release. And that is largely due to this combustion of fossil fuels. We're going to notice some trends in carbon fluxes, both within a year and throughout multiple years. And this is a diagram called a Keeling curve. It's something that you'll be expected to you know, find familiar. And what we're gonna notice are two trends. So I see an overall trend and I see an annual trend of up and down throughout the year. Let's talk about this annual trend first. So I'm actually gonna talk about this part every year where we're seeing a dip, okay, where carbon dioxide levels are going down during the year. Well, what could possibly be causing a dip in carbon dioxide levels? Well, that's probably because there is more photosynthesis happening. So photosynthesis is going to be a process that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the more photosynthesis I'm doing, the more carbon dioxide is going to be removed. Okay, so that's responsible for this reuptake and this dip in carbon dioxide. This is likely due to it being during the summer of whatever hemisphere we're in. It's not reliable to say it's a certain month it's just a season okay so the annual trend of this up and down is due to photosynthesis rates this uptick here that we're seeing every year is probably due to the fact that it's winter so in winter there's going to be less photosynthesis and not as much photosynthetic uh, processes that are going to absorb the carbon dioxide so we'll see this little annual trend upwards that's very different than the overall trend. So if I'm looking at the overall trend, it's not going up and down, it is steadily increasing. And so this is not something that we can attribute to normal winter, summer, more photosynthesis, less photosynthesis cycles. This is due to human activity. And the most likely culprit here is that combustion of fossil fuels, okay? Um, adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than is being uh, taken in. Theme C, interaction, interdependence. Let's not be surprised that we're asked to step back and recognize that photosynthesis and aerobic respiration are part of the cycle and they're also part of the inter dependence of individual organisms. So here I have the photosynthesis equation, carbon dioxide in water, yielding glucose and oxygen. What's interesting here is that the products of photosynthesis are the reactants for aerobic respiration. 
inflammation, that in respiration, we're using that glucose and oxygen, and the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. So again, the products of one happen to be the reactants of another. And so we get this really kind of like cool cycle and dependence. So autotrophs and heterotrophs are going to depend on each other for these metabolic substrates. Autotrophs need heterotrophs, they need them. And in the same way, heterotrophs need these autotrophs. Now, the amount of carbon that's exchanged, like look at this, so I see glucose here, I see glucose here, carbon here, carbon here. Such huge amounts are being exchanged between autotrophs and heterotrophs that they can actually be estimated or measured in a unit called a gigaton, and that is 10 to the 15th power of grams. That's a lot of zeros I'm adding on there. So in terms of that carbon flux in our carbon cycle, huge, huge, huge amounts of carbon. We've really only been talking about carbon as a nutrient that cycles within an ecosystem, but we're leaving out a lot of important stuff. Now, living things are made out of mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and then small amounts of other elements. All of these nutrients, all of these elements must also be recycled. It's not just carbon. So for all of these, there's going to be a special cycle by which living things obtain them through either absorption or consumption, and then they get cycled through the different parts of an ecosystem. The reason why they must be cycled is because these quantities are limited. Unless you think asteroids are going to come deliver more nitrogen to Earth, maybe they will, but not enough. Okay, all these things must be recycled by decomposers. Okay, so when an organism dies, it's very important that those decomposers can take apart all of these molecules and then recycle those nutrients back to the soil. So because of that, because this is a relatively close system, Earth as a whole, I like to say that nutrients cycle, yet energy is going to flow. So energy for most ecosystems is going to originate in the sun, and that flows through an ecosystem and is eventually lost as heat. However, we have a constant supply of energy source, so it's okay that that can't be recycled. Again, this only emphasizes this theme here in theme C of interaction and interdependence dependence, in order for these nutrients to cycle properly, we really need to take care of all of these fragile interactions between autotrophs, heterotrophs, and the different organisms in our ecosystems.